Hello folks, Professor Fiore here. And with this video, we're going to start a four-part series on a little device that I call the Pocket Rocket. It's a personal amplifier. What the heck is that? Well, let's take a trip back in time. In the 1980s, when things were strange, when there was no internet to speak of, cell phones did not exist, people wore clothing with large padding on their shoulders. Very strange things about Iran-Contra affair. Hmm. During this time, there was a device called a Walkman, which was a small cassette player that you could wear on your belt, hook it up to some headphones, and walk around and have tunes. What a wonderful idea. Well, it occurred to me that that would be a useful sort of thing for a musician. In other words, if you played guitar or bass or maybe an electronic keyboard, it would be nice to have a little personal amplifier that you could plug your device into, plug some headphones into it, and then you could play. You could practice anytime you wanted and you would not bother people, right? Beautiful. So essentially what the Pocket Rocket is, is this little amplifier that's suitable for these sorts of instruments. It has a high input impedance, so it'll work just fine with a passive guitar or bass. Further, you want it to be portable, so this thing will run on a single 9-volt battery. Now, if you want to have it like in your home studio, your bedroom, whatever, you can always hook it up to one of those little DC wall warts, in other words, a little transformer rectifier thing that you just plug directly into the wall. You could do that. Along with headphones, the device can also drive a small loudspeaker. Okay, you know, I'm not talking about concert levels here, but enough that you can hear it. Okay, you know, kind of like a table radio, if you remember those things. So what kind of controls does it have on it? Well, being that it was designed, like I said, for guitars, basses, things like that, it includes, obviously, volume, but also a distortion drive. So you don't have to plug in a fuzz pedal. You can just use this thing as is. As a matter of fact, you could actually use this as kind of like a stomp box. In other words, you could use its distortion as part of your signal change. It also has a brightness switch and a three-band, in other words, bass, treble, mid, equalizer. So it has shelving style of bass and treble and then a resonant style mid-band EQ. Now the brightness switch basically kicks in somewhere around, oh, 2.3 kilohertz or so, and it rolls off single order, in other words, 6 dB per octave. And this is designed to sort of echo the kind of sound effect you would get playing your guitar through a normal amplifier that was hooked up to maybe a 12-inch loudspeaker because that doesn't have a lot of real high end. So we sort of artificially roll this off a little bit early so that it sounds more like it using your headphones. Okay? So like I said, this was designed back in the 1980s. Very common components. They're very inexpensive. Right? There's nothing here that's like antiquated that you can't find anymore. All right. So, you know, it's, it's been tried and tested, as I like to say. Um, and I've used this in a, in a variety of different uh, situations. You can also, if you want, modify this to do a, maybe a larger amplifier. You could get rid of the final part of it so that you're using, you know, maybe a, a larger output. Right? In other words, so that you can get 50 watts or you know, 200 watts or whatever it is that you're interested in. Obviously, you're not going to run it on a single 9-volt battery anymore, but you could use part of it, like I said, as this sort of front end. All right? So there's going to be three more videos here. The first one is going to go through the front end, which is the um, sort of the distortion preamp kind of thing, that section. The next one will go through the EQ part, and the last one, the fourth video, will go through the final output, right? The thing that drives the loudspeaker or headphones, all right? Now, this design, just to be really clear on this, is not an OT in the public domain. This is released using my usual Creative Commons license. It's a non-commercial, share-alike, with attribution license. 
What that means effectively is you can use this for your personal musical adventures. You can use it for educational use. Essentially, non-commercial means you can't just sort of copy this thing and start selling it, okay? So it's like all of my books, all my videos and so forth, it uses that same sort of license. So ultimately, this is the prototype that I made back in the mid-1980s. So we've got a little hobby box over here. Um, you can see the controls, okay? So right off the top, there's bass, mid, treble, little knobs. And then uh, this is the volume control, and right here is the distortion drive control, bright switch, and an on-off switch. Now, you can also set up the on-off with a quarter-inch jack. And over here on the side, you can kind of see that there are some jacks. There's a quarter-inch jack. There's also a quarter-inch jack for uh, headphones, you know, normal quarter-inch jack-type headphones, plus one for eighth-inch style headphones, which are more common now. And there's another jack, you can't really see it, but that's for the DC wall wart that I was mentioning. Now, normally you would, you would set this up so that the, the knobs and such were on the other side down here. This is, of course, the bottom. With the, you can see the screws on it. But I just found it easier when I was playing around with this prototype to sort of mount it this way. So here's the sort of open version of it. This is kind of nice because when it opens up, you just take off this one plate and, you know, all the knobs go with it. All right, and here's the printed circuit board inside. So you can see this is not huge. We've got a couple of integrated circuits, you know, a handful of quarter watt resistors, um, a bunch of small film capacitors and some small uh, aluminum electrolytic capacitors, a couple of diodes over here, um, a larger electrolytic. This is actually the one that's used uh, to couple the output for the loudspeaker. Um, there you have it, okay? So you can fit this into a pretty small uh, little box, right? Because, you know, I mean, these are standard four-pin through-hole mini-dip chips right here, okay? So it's not really all that big. All right. Here's the circuit. So what do we have? Well, I'm, I'm going to run through this really quick. This section right up here, this is the preamp and the distortion section. So there's going to be a video on this. That's going to be video number two. We'll get into this. Right in the middle here with this second op amp, this is the bass mid treble EQ section. All righty. Now, you will notice if you look carefully, right, it says IC1A and IC1B. What I'm using here is a dual op amp. Okay, now what I've uh, thrown in mind is an LF-353. This, again, this was made back in like 1986. So uh, a 353 is basically a dual LF-351, functionally equivalent to a TL-082, TL-081. So it's a 8-pin uh, mini dip, and uh, you got two op amps in there. So they share the same power supply, which is going to work out well for us. Uh, if you want to do a somewhat more modern chip, I would suggest going with the LF-411 family, which in this case would be an LF-412 for the dual. It has the same pinout. That's kind of nice. The AC performance is very similar, so we're looking at similar slew rates, similar um, game bandwidth product. That's all going to be very closely the same. The 411 series has much nicer like DC offset, like precision kind of uh, parameters. Uh, much nicer than the, uh, than the 351 or 081 series op amps. All right, so that's, you know, that's kind of up to you. If I was going to do it today, I would grab the 411. The price differential is, you know, really inconsequential. So, you know, a bunch of resistors here. You can see there's a bunch of pots, right? We've got three pots over here, another, um, another pot for the drive. And then finally, the third section is down here, right? So, again, there's going to be another video on that. That'll be the fourth video. Um, IC number two, this is an LM386. This is a uh, sort of a purpose-built little audio power amp that was, again, produced in the sort of the early mid-80s by National Semiconductor, which eventually got absorbed by uh, Texas Instruments. So they still sell this. It's a Class AB chip, and it's essentially designed for you know, somewhere in the, say, maybe half watt to one watt output all depending on what you use for a power supply and what the load impedance is. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot. You're like, a watt? What am I going to do with a watt? Well, you put a watt into a standard set of headphones, 
it's pretty stinking loud. So, you know, there it is. Even a little, you know, 8 ohm loudspeaker you can hook up into here. You'll hear it playing. It's not going to rock the house down, but, you know, you'd be surprised at how much power that actually is. You know, people are so used to seeing these, you know, 200 watt amplifiers and stacks of amplifiers. But you got to remember, you know, that's for a, a big concert audience here or, you know, studio, you know, whatever you're using. But in this case, this is just a little tiny um, practice thing you can just, you know, throw in your pocket, basically, right? Hence the name Pocket Rocket. Now, you might wonder, wonder about the, the spelling Rocket, R O C K I T. When I originally designed this, I had, um, I was thinking of making it a kit, hence the pun, um, that you know people could just buy printed circuit board and so forth and build it. But um, that turned out to be quite honest with you, more hassle than I wanted to deal with. So you know, I made mine basically and didn't make many more. So, uh, but it's here for you, right? You can you can use this and have some fun with it. The 386 is sort of a, a minimal kind of parts chip there isn't really a lot you have to hook up to it basically there's like a resistor and a couple of capacitors you know that was designed specifically so that um you could make something like let's say a table radio or maybe a kid's wall you know walkie talkie they used to be popular years ago um, and you wouldn't need all that much you know it was fully self-supporting in, in that regard okay and if you notice here i have this hooked up to a stereo um, quarter inch jack basically that's the symbol for it so this is really dual mono we don't have two separate amplifiers so if you're playing an instrument that has dual outputs like maybe you have an uh like a rickenbacker you know like a like a 4003 bass that has you know rico sound outputs right for the two for the two pickups or maybe you have um a chapman stick okay and you've got separate outputs for the for the uh, treble strings and the bass strings this is really designed for a mono instrument, right? And then it's just going to throw this out and you're going to get dual mono left and right. If you wanted to, of course, you could make um, some kind of a split here. You could literally make two of them, which would be kind of freaky. Um, in a way, it would be kind of nice that if you, if you could have separate kind of distortion. Uh, I read an article once that, that claimed, and I don't know if this is true, but claimed that Chris Squire of Yes, the bass player, would split the output of his uh, Rickenbacker, his, his 4001, and he would send uh, the bass to a bass amp and the, the treble pickup to a guitar uh, amplifier and run distortion on it. So he could get sort of an overdrive, but also get clean bass at the same time. Um, hey, let's be creative, right? Let's have some fun with it. Maybe the last thing you might be looking at here that I'm just gonna run out really quick is this weird little thing over here for power. Um, like I said, I'm gonna get into this in detail and there's lots of resistors over here which are designed for the single polarity power supply. It only has a single nine volt battery. And you might be wondering, why is there a diode here? Now that would be a fair question. Why is there a diode here? Because it's just a nine volt battery. Now I have drawn a switch, okay? Because um, like in the one I did, there's a physical switch there. But like I said, you could use a switched quarter-inch jack. There's a plus and a minus to this. Um, if you brought in, and I'm not showing it here, if you brought in the 9-volt uh, wall wart, you might bring that jack in right to this point. Because that way you could open the switch, in other words, off, put it in the off position, and then you wouldn't have the voltage going back onto the 9 volt because would, this wouldn't necessarily be a you know, rechargeable battery, right? So you could do that. Or you could bring it on this side of it, this side of the diode, so that it would uh, you know, block that. Um, but really the reason why the diode is there is very simple. A lot of people don't think of these kinds of things. You know, as a musician... You know, you might be, you might use this just like a warm-up kind of thing, right? You know, bef before you're going to do a gig. It might be dark, probably will be dark somewhere. Uh, you can't see very well, but you got to change the battery. It's very easy to take a battery, like a 9-volt battery, and stick it on the terminals backwards. In other words, have the thing rotated 180 degrees. Well, if you did that, and this diode wasn't here, you'd have reverse-biased these op-amps. 
And that's a really quick and easy way to destroy an op amp. You put a reverse bias power supply on it. Boom, pop goes the weasel. So that's why D1 is really here. If you accidentally put the battery on backwards, or maybe you even miswired the, the 9 volt uh, wall wart that's coming in over here, same thing, right? You're going to reverse bias this diode. Nothing's going to work, but nothing's going to blow up. And that's the most important part, okay? So this is just a standard rectifying diode, like, a, you know, basically a, a 1 in 4,000 series. And since the voltage isn't big, you can get away with a 4,001. The other two diodes over here, D2 and D3, these are basically switching diodes. Uh, a 914 would work fine. Pretty much just about any diode will work fine over here. Um, maybe a matter of taste, I don't know. So we're going to, you know, look at how this works, but I'm also going to explain how you can do some mods on it, you, how you might want to change, for example, uh, the way in which the EQ works. You might want to tweak some of the frequencies and cut boost kinds of things and so on and so forth. All right. So that's where we're going to, where we're heading. And the, like I said, the first part of that, the first dig down into it is video number two in the series, part two. And we're going to talk specifically about this front end section right here, which is the preamp and uh, distortion section, the overdrive section. Okay. So stay tuned for part two. Until then, take care.